Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm so glad you could join us for this first session uh, for 2022. Hope the year is going well so far for you and that we're all keeping safe and getting on with life as best we can. Today's webinar, we are going to talk about cleaning chemistry. So today is webinar one of a two part series uh, focusing specifically on clean chemistries. Thank you for joining SAFMED Education. As normal, our webinars are sponsored by SAFMED and SAFMED has been your uh, solutions partner in both the operating theater and the CCSD environment for the last 30 years. Thank you, SAFMED. Right, now that I've introduced myself, I'm going to turn my camera off to save us some bandwidth, but thank you so much for joining. Watch the slides, listen as we chat. I hope you enjoy what we have to share today. As I said, our webinar series, this two part series will focus on cleaning chemistries. We'll begin, which is always a good place to start with a definition and a definition of cleaning. Then we'll begin to focus a little bit more about cleaning chemistries and unpack the terminology we use in cleaning chemistries. Then we'll focus on cleaning chemistries used in the pre-cleaning environment, cleaning chemistries used for the main cleaning session, normally in our world on the dirty side of the CCSD. And of course, then some chemistries that are important for maintaining our instruments and how they can help us to uh, get some longevity out of our instrumentation. When it comes to cleaning and definitions, of course, one of the places one likes to go to is straight away to, um, to our uh, uh, guidelines that we can rely on trust in. And one of them, of course, is the World Health Organization guidelines. Cleaning, uh, according to the World Health Organization's guidelines and decontamination, is the first step. It's the first step required to physically remove some form of contamination from a device, including organic materials such as uh, blood, secretions, excretions, and microorganisms to prepare a medical device for disinfection or sterilization. If we go to the ISO standard, so for this particular um, uh, presentation, I've referred to ISO triple one three nine, which is really the um, the definitions or the vocabulary and terms used in sterilization. And it refers to cleaning as the removal of a contaminant to the extent necessary for further processing for the intended use of the device. So of course, the intended use of the device will uh, influence how it gets processed as a whole. A cleaning agent is a physical or chemical entity or combination of both that has some form of activity to render an item clean. I think that makes sense. We all understand and hopefully understand what cleaning is. Talking about the importance of cleaning now and to talk about that, I'm going to refer to this uh, published paper uh, published in the American Journal of Infection Control in 2020. It was quite an amazing study that actually looked at the effectiveness of manual versus automated cleaning on Staphylococcus epidermis biofilm on surgical instruments. So for now, I'm just going to talk about the introduction and I'll cover a little bit more in depth detail about this particular um, uh, section a little later. But let's start with uh, with this introduction. Here we go. In the introduction to this particular paper, it states that cleaning is considered to be the most important step in reprocessing cycle for surgical instruments, especially uh, for its influence on the effectiveness of sterilization, a very important point for us. Cleaning promotes the removal of a variety of contaminants, such as blood, mucus and fats, and reduces the microbial load that remains on instruments after use. And this, of course, will help to ensure safety for reuse and the and of course for personnel handling these instruments. A nice uh, uh, important fact out of that statement really is this, isn't it? It's the most important step in instrument reprocessing. And it's why I chose to focus on cleaning and the effectiveness of cleaning as part of my own masters. It removes the contaminants, great. It removes all sorts of contaminants, organic and inorganic or non-organic stuff that our instruments are exposed to. Uh, the contaminant removal makes it safe for the staff that are now 
um, dealing with these instruments, compiling sets, using them, putting them together, it is now safer for them to handle. And of course, at the end of the day, it's going to be safe for reuse on the next patient. Step one of the process, as we know. I don't know about you, but I personally would never want my department or my hospital displayed all over the media with some headlines like these. Now, these headlines are not from that long ago. Uh, they're in the last three years or so. Um, I'm not sure if you may have seen any of them. We did post a couple of them on, on some of our media feeds. The Porter Hospital at the moment is, is an, undergoing a terrible lawsuit with hundreds of severe infections, apparently, um, as it states in the media, linked to contaminated surgical items. And an incident in Dublin uh, at a hospital there stating that 4,000 veterans were exposed to infection because of improperly cleaned equipment. And so it goes on, and these media publications are on all the time. And it's very, very sad to see and incredibly scary. And I'm very sure it's something none of us want to be involved in. We also don't want to be in any of these journal publications. Journal publications talking about retained debris in orthopedic instruments and their cannula. Uh, looking at uh, the this publication from Southworth back in 2014, I think it was already, that was actually um, a conglomeration or review of a multitude of incidents that had already been published at that point. And then the outbreak in Texas, and that related to arthroscopy surgery, and I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with that either, but it was all around arthrosc um, arthroscopy shavers and how the shavers had a whole bunch of contaminants up the channels that hadn't up the shaft that hadn't been cleaned properly, and really something we need to be looking at and focused on in terms of outbreaks or potential outbreaks of infection. None of us want to be in the headlines or the published papers because we didn't clean our devices correctly. Right, so we've looked at cleaning as a principle. Now let's start to unpack the terminology and some of the concepts around the cleaning chemistries themselves. Remember, that's what we have to fo focus on today. Cleaning chemistries in South Africa are defined as a medical device. In fact, all over the world, uh, in Europe and in Americas, cleaning uh, chemistries are medical devices. So remember when we're cleaning our medical devices and our surgical instruments, we need to be cleaning them with medical device type products, not with household cleaning products. Very important point to note. And of course, being a class A medical device, it, the best practice, of course, would be to buy detergent that's manufactured by a company that has an ISO 13485 certification, which means they're certified to be able to produce, make, sell uh, medical devices. It would be a value add if that product had a CE marking, gives you another bit level of a surety. And ideally, you definitely want to buy something that's distributed or sold by a company in South Africa that holds a medical devices establishment license, which of course falls under SAPRA. As we know, if you were buying PPE from a company that is not licensed, it is going to be problematic. So of course, we always want to be buying from a reputable medical devices established, licensed company in South Africa. And please remember to buy detergents, making sure that they're always sold with an instruction for use and a material safety data sheet. I attended in January, I used my time wisely to um, go through a whole series of webinars, some of which were from last year that I didn't quite get a chance to get to. This particular one was hosted late in 2021. I managed to view it in January 2022. The presenter was Nancy Kaiser, and Nancy Kaiser, I've actually heard her speak live at, at a session in, in Holland, and I watched her on this particular webinar as well, is a really well-renowned scientist, I think is the right term to use. She holds numerous patents for cleaning chemistries that she has personally designed. So I think we can trust what she has to say. And um, in interest of getting the content across correctly and accurately, I have copied and pasted some of her slides directly, um, but I will, as you see, I've referenced directly to her work as we go through, and I thank her so much for the learning that she has provided. It really was insightful. So, Nancy goes on in the beginning of her webinar, she goes on to in great depth to explain various substrates and cleaning chemistries, what they do, and of course we'll cover that in detail as we go along today and, and next week, Thursday. 
In the beginning, she talks about the benefits of effective soil removal. Of course, that makes good sense uh, because we know that residual soils in themselves can foster biofilm formation. They can actually trap the cleaning chemistries, that, which also can help prevent proper rinsing, which means not only do you have soil of some uh, foreign patient soil on a device, but you also potentially have residual chemistries left on the device. Uh, those residual soils can cause damage to surfaces of the instruments. And we know for a fact that it reduces the effectiveness of either your high level disinfection or your sterilization. If you're using cleaning chemistries that are not very effective, what's going to happen is it means that you're going to need more extensive mechanical input when you're doing the cleaning. We'll cover that now now it's in a circle. So you need to scrub more, you need to use a harder brush, you need to put more effort into it. And all of that potential scrubbing and potential effort can cause damage and scratching to your devices. And any damaged area or scratches in turn is a place where you can harbor bacteria. So very important point around why we want a chemistry that's going to do the job correctly. So what are the attributes? What do we need from a cleaning chemistry? What does the ideal cleaning chemistry for cleaning our medical devices give us? Remember, I'm focusing on a, on a chemistry for medical devices. If I'm shampooing my hair, I use shampoo. If I'm cleaning my carpets, I use carpet shampoo. If I'm doing my dishes, I use sunlight or whatever it is, dishwashing soap. I don't use sunlight to wash my hair with because the chemistry formulations are bespoke. They're specific to the purpose. So what are the attributes that we need for a cleaning chemistry that's there to clean surgical and medical devices, our instruments? So we need to be able to remove organic and non-organic soils, because if you think about it, that's what our devices are exposed to. And the non or inorganic type things can include um, antibiotics. Sometimes we use them in the operating field, in the, in, the, um, in the wounds, creams and lotions that we may apply, the cleaning solutions, all sorts of things that can be deposited on our instruments that are organic and, of course, non or inorganic. Ideally, we want a cleaning chemistry that has the ability to retain minerals in water. And we'll talk more about water and water quality and minerals that can come in water naturally. And generally, they contain things called chelating ingredients or agents, and they help bind the water minerals so that the water minerals stay in the water and they don't end up forming or causing spotting or white spots. I'm sure you've seen them before, both in the automated washer disinfectors or on the instruments themselves. So it's very helpful if our instruments or our chemistries can prevent that from happening. We want something that is low foaming or has some form of controlled foaming, because foaming itself can affect your cleaning equipment. Um, if something foams a lot in a washer disinfector, it affects the efficacy of the cleaning. And remember proteins themselves, which of course um, a lot of the patient organic material contains proteins, make foam. So foam is really a big issue. When you're cleaning manually, if there's less foam in the basin, you can see a little bit clearer, clearer of what's happening in the basin. And hopefully then you don't uh, injure yourself, puncture your glove with a nice skin hook or some piece of equipment that you're trying to clean. So it really does help even in the manual phase of things. You can see a little better. Of course, the chemistry must be safe to use on the instrument materials. And instruments are made of all sorts of things, stainless steel, titanium, copper, brass, instruments with plastic parts, all sorts of plastic polymers. Think of laparoscopic instruments, their parts, their moving parts, their coatings. All of those uh, materials range and, and differ, and so we need a detergent that's not going to be harsh on those materials. That's why we can't use household cleaning chemistries or at least one of the reasons. It's better if in our environment, the chemistry that we're buying is liquid because the liquid will be able to mix better. And therefore you've got better efficacy out of your detergent at the end of the day. And it needs to be free rinsing. Because remember, we want to rinse off the re residuals of the organic materials that we're trying to clean, but we also want to rinse off the detergent itself because else the detergent is another foreign body and another potential irritant or contaminant for the patient. 
we need to be able to rinse it off. It needs to be free rinsing. We would like our detergents to be biodegradable. Why? Because then when it ends up in the rivers, it is digested and degraded by the common bacteria that we found in our lakes and our rivers. It's there, they live there, and that way we don't cause any damage to plant or animal or fish to any life. It is a value add if your detergent comes in a concentrated format, because in a concentrated format, you're not paying for water, you're paying for the concentrated detergent, which means at the end of the day, you're going to get more value out of a particular bottle. You'll get more cycles out of one bottle, and hopefully that's one less aeroplane or mode of transport that reduces your carbon footprint, perhaps just a little more. Another value add to consider when you're buying a detergent. Okay, I'm going through a lot of information, hopefully not too quickly. Let's move on to a very important concept of cleaning, and this is Sinner's Circle. I think at some point we'll host ourselves a separate actual presentation or a separate series that focuses on cleaning, just on cleaning and the factors around cleaning. Of course, today we focused more on the chemistry, one aspect of cleaning. So when it comes to cleaning, there are important concepts, and that includes the mechanical action, the scrubbing, okay? the actual chemistry, the time that the device or instrument is cleaned, as well as the time that it gets, or the exposure time it gets to the chemistry, and the temperature and the temperature of the water. Now, these are all important key variables for successful cleaning. Herbert Sinner actually described this interrelationship for cleaning uh, between the mechanical action, the chemical action, the time and the temperature of the water way back in 1959 already an important concept. And if you're a person, you're a, you're a Nancy Kayser and you're busy making a cleaning chemistry for us to use in our CSSDs, these are the parameters that you need to take into consideration because we're going to want something that requires the least amount of mechanical action, hopefully, because the more we scrub, the more of an issue it is potentially to damage the instrument. We're hoping that it's going to be a chemistry that acts pretty quickly. So somehow or another, we've got a design or the Nancy's of the world has to design a chemistry that um, gives you a little bit more chemical action so that you can reduce the mechanical action, hopefully reduce the time that it takes to clean and at the end of the day still end up with a clean instrument, safe to use on our patients. So that's in a circle and a concept we can cover in more depth in a cleaning uh, specific webinar. Of course, we now discussed water. We discussed water and temperature uh, together, how they matter in terms of cleaning efficacy. But tap water naturally contains numerous elements, including minerals, metals, and bacteria. Now, the quality of water and the components of water are going to vary. They're going to vary from hospital to hospital, from region to region, from province to province, whether or not you've had your seasonal rainfall, where you're at in your seasonal rainfall. I remember having quite a few issues over the last couple of years in the Cape when the Cape had that terrible, terrible drought. You can take a detergent, the very self-same detergent, use it in one hospital and five kilometers down the road, use the same detergent in another hospital, and it may not work as effectively in the, in the same two hospitals because of the makeup of the chemistries or the constitutes of the water quality. It really has a profound effect or potentially a profound effect on what you're doing. Again, Nancy Kayser and her type are going to think about this when they're developing their detergents and try to take this into account. And wherever possible, try and make the uh, detergent as user-friendly as possible for a variety of water conditions, because we don't know what those conditions are going to be. Maybe it's more minerals, maybe it's harder water, uh, maybe it's more metals in it, maybe the aluminium's quite high, maybe the uh, calcium carbonates are high, or the chlorine's high, or the silicates are high. Depends on where you are, depends on your environment, are you next to a mountain, a river, a stream. Those all influence your water quality at the end of the day. 
These are a few pictures that we've taken in the field before over the years of the inside of some automated washer disinfectors. The picture in the middle is actually the, the drain, the sieve. You may recognize it from an ultrasonic cleaner, and that's a buildup of some grime that we found. In fact, the tub itself wasn't too bad because of all of the, uh, all of the ultrasonic cleaning efficacy. Uh, it managed to keep some of the grime out. On the left is a really, really grimy buildup of heaven only knows what substrates within the chamber of a washer disinfectant because of really weird water quality. In fact, in that sieve, we even found some gravel and some soil. Um, so really difficult water to manage in that environment. The one on the right looks more like hard water, um, the kind of spotting that you get from hard water minerals. Again, that we need to take into consideration. In this interesting article uh, published in the Clinical Services Journal, Choosing a High Performance Detergent, written by Richard Bancroft. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with him. He sits on quite a few um, ISO committees. He chairs some ISO committees, so he's quite a, a clever guy in terms of standards and actually is a um, a validation engineer in the UK or has been in his past. He goes on in this article to state that a variation, um, let's start from the beginning, one of the bigger variables with cleaning in practice can be the variations in water quality. And water, pure water, is a much better solvent, of course it is, but in itself it can be corrosive. The biggest issue with water um, is the dissolved substances within it like a high sodium iron content can cause excessive frothing and foaming, which in turn can impede the impingement. Remember, the impingement in a washer is the force of the water. That can decrease in the washer disinfectors efficacy. Also, certain conditions cause deposition of dissolved um, or suspended species, um, such as the coating of dissolved metals on instrument surfaces, which can cause staining. Chlorine can cause pitting corrosion on stainless steel surfaces, and it's typically present in metal salts in uh, sodium chloride, for example, or calcium chloride in our waters. So thinking about that, our detergents that we're using in our environment to to clean off specific types of soils need to be manufactured and made with all of these things in mind to try to get the best out of it. So what are the possible formulations or the components in this kind of detergent? So this is Nancy, of course, she's making these detergents. We need water because it's a solvent. We need something that's going to break down certain soils, and that can be acids, bases, or enzymes. So hydrolysis, breaking things down. We need surfactants, and we'll explain a lot more about surfactants in our next webinar. I spoke already about chelating agents that help with controlling of hard water. In they attract the, attract the metal ions, so the metal ions stay in the water and don't end up being deposited on your instruments. We need builders. We need corrosion inhibitors to help protect the surfaces against corrosion. We need biocides and we need solvents. So those are the terms that we're going to be working with today, all of these terms today and, of course, next week at the same time. Often, and the easiest way to classify our detergents is to look at them in these different structures, one being enzymatic, the second being neutral, the third being alkaline, and the fourth being speciality type products. And we'll delve into that just now. Okay, what have we done so far? We've spoken about cleaning and we've covered the importance of cleaning. We know the clinical importance. We know that it's gonna interfere if you don't clean your uh, devices properly. You're not gonna sterilize them or disinfect them if that's the um, next step in the process. Cleaning is important clinically. We've started to unpack cleaning chemistries a little bit. We've understood that there are many components in cleaning chemistries that together combined are going to have an effect on helping clean our instruments effectively. And that, that component, those components are all put together in different ratios to buy you, or to buy you, to create a, a detergent that's going to do the job we need to to uh, clean different types of soils. And we'll go into a lot more detail in the next webinar on 
different soils and what does what with what different type of soil. So for now, let's focus on the concept of pre-cleaning. What do we need in the pre-cleaning environment? I'm taking you back to that published paper, the one on biofilms, actually. It's quite an interesting paper. What they had done in this uh, research was they had purposefully um, inoculated the ratchets, uh, the shanks and the jaws of Kraus forceps with the Staphylococcus epidermis, left it all to form a biofilm and then started to decontaminate these devices. Some were cleaned manually and some were cleaned and they refer to in an automated process. In fact, the automated process in this paper was actually an ultrasonic cleaner. I would be quite curious to know if the results would have been different if they had put it in an, in a, uh, an ISO 15883 compliant automated washer disinfectant. That would have been also interesting to see those results. But let's work with what they did. So they cleaned these devices that had these uh, nice biofilms on them manually and in an ultrasonic cleaner. What they found was that both the ultrasonic and the manual cleaning definitely reduced the amount of bacteria or the bacterial load on the instruments, without a doubt. However, they found that the ultrasonic method was more effective, but in their findings, neither actually completely removed the biofilms. Then they looked at other factors and other criteria and what they stated in their conclusions, as you can read over there. Automatic cleaning was more effective than manual cleaning, but neither method removed biofilms completely. However, the pre-cleaning pre conditions and the design of the, of the forceps was also a critical factor. The pre-cleaning conditions, and that's the point we're going to talk to now. The AORN guidelines, which have just been updated, updated recently, some new um, add-ons. This is um, from 2020. Uh, it discusses the importance of pre-cleaning. I used this particular article because it had such nice graphics on it. AORN, Association of Operating Room Nurses, of course, clearly states that we need to prepare for decontamination at the point of use where blood and other bio burden dries on instruments, because if it does, it makes the removal very difficult, which, as we know, if, will affect the effectiveness of your disinfection and sterilization. So any item that is opened onto the sterile field should be cleaned and decontaminated regardless of whether it was used or not. It states over there you, that you need to start your pre-cleaning as soon as possible after use. It also talks about the fact that before transport, you should separate your shops from your other items in puncture-resistant uh, containers to make sure that you're transporting safely. Then on the rest of the graphic, it clearly states, remove gross soil from instruments during the procedure by wiping them with a sterile sponge or swab and sterile water. So every scrub sister that I know that's worth their salt has been doing that for years. And even during the case, if a surgeon tells you the scissors is blunt, you take it away, you wipe it off, you give it back to him, and now it's not blunt anymore, which is true because what builds up on the instrument affects how well it can function and perform. So we all do that, I hope. All removing gross soil from our devices and instruments throughout the case. Also, towards the end of the case, when we have opportunity, we want to open and disassemble instruments made of multiple points, pieces. Not always easy to do at this point, but important if we can. Then the guideline goes on to talk about keeping instruments moist by covering with a, a moistened towel, not in a bowl of water. I'll come back to that. And wherever possible, or if you can't clean them straight away, you can treat them with an instrument cleaner as per the manufacturer's instructions for use. This article in the Infection Control Today, which is also associated, I think if I remember correctly, with the AORN, discusses decontamination of surgical instruments and says it clearly states begins in the operating room. Instruments should be prepared in such a manner that organic soils will not dry on surfaces. We can do this by placing them in a towel moistened with sterile water, not saline, hey, please remember that, not saline and placing the towel inside a package to try and maintain humid conditions or using instrument sprays designed for pre-treatment. 
For example, instruments can be placed in an appropriate container treated with an enzymatic foam or gel designed for this purpose. The foam or gel then adheres to the surfaces of the contaminated items, breaking down the soil, so initiating the process. In addition, the foams and gels will not splash or spill during transport. So, having been a good classic scrub system in the South African setting, this is all I know. I know bowls of water. That's what we did all of our lives. When I scrubbed for a couple of uh, for a couple of months in the UK, it was the most daunting process ever because I didn't have a bowl of water to work with. It was really weird, um, but I had to learn uh, to cope without a bowl of water. There wasn't a bowl of water to soak my instruments in. And when I first joined SAFMED, I have to admit, I heard about these types of products and I thought, ah, no man, these people just trying to make money now. That's ridiculous. I've been using a bowl of water for years now. Of course it works. But the more you think about it, water is corrosive. Water has a terrible effect on the instruments themselves. The pH of blood is 8. It really starts to damage the instruments. So leaving them like this in bowls of water with bits of blood on them is not necessarily the best idea. This is a bowl, mm -hmm, one of those bowls that we use for soaking our instruments in. I went to, um, to try help with a product complaint where the customer complained that um, the detergent they were using was making the bowl do this. If you look closely at that bowl, that's a combination of staining and rust rust that's developing because of water standing in that bowl for hours on end. If you take a closer look at these pictures, hopefully you can see that is pitting corrosion over there, those little black spots, and that's some more corrosion and deposits of some form of minerals on the ratchets of those particular instruments. When I look more closely at what our instruments look like, the more I realize that the concept of keeping the instruments in bowls of water is really not that wise, just for the sake of the instrument itself. And that's not with even talking about splashing and spilling and splushing down the corridor and what we're potentially putting all over the operating room for floors or putting people at risk with. Transport gels and foams specifically contain corrosion inhibitors, well most of them do, and assuming you're buying from a reputable company, they generally are pH neutral so they are friendlier, they won't harm your surfaces or softer metals, and they initiate cleaning at the point of use, and that's what they are designed to do. There's so much work that's been done over the years, especially in Europe and in the UK, around drying of proteins, worrying about, of course, proteins, remember the UK and Christopher Jacobs disease, and the value add of keeping instruments moist uh, or managing them by keeping them moist and preventing the soils from drying. Very important concept. So, summarizing a little bit of what we've done. Cleaning, importance of cleaning, center circle. Cleaning chemistries, some of the terminology, some of the components that are in the formulations that we need to make an effective cleaning chemistry. And of course, the importance of pre-cleaning. Right, so we've got about 10 minutes left, and in those 10 minutes, I'm going now to talk to start the process of the chemistries that we can use for the main cleaning event, and then we'll continue with that and the um, what we need to maintain our instruments at the, uh, for next week. Right, remember I said enzymatic, we're dividing our, new, our detergents and cleaning chemistries into enzymatics, neutrals, alkalines, and speciality type chemistries. Let's unpack that for a few minutes. Enzymes are designed to break down large molecules into smaller ones, into water-soluble, dissolve them type things. That's what we want to do. So enzymatic chemistry, so uh, remember chemistries contain can contain a whole multitude of things. Those with enzymes in them contain enzymes and other things. We'll talk about those substrates next week. But within this particular things, ones that have majority enzymatics are uh, there to create a chemical reaction to break down the soils, hydrolysis, into smaller molecules, and those smaller mo molecules can be easily removed and washed away. Generally speaking, enzymatic cleaners are going to have a neutral pH, 
they are highly effective at removing organic soils. But remember, our instruments are exposed not only to organics, to all sorts of soils. Enzymatic cleaners are generally the ones that we use for manual cleaning in the sink. Um, they can be used with a washer disinfector in an automated cleaning process. Certainly they can be used in ultrasonic cleaners, but in automated washer disinfectors, it really depends on the setup of that particular automated washer disinfector. So when you buy an automated washer disinfector, the, the person who manufactures it is going to say to you, here are the recommended chemistries that you need to use with this washer. And the reason for that is because they have validated the cleaning process of that particular machine with that particular type of detergent, that particular substrate. At the end of the day, they have to do all sorts of tests. They test the rinse water to make sure that the detergent is properly rinsed off. They have uh, specific settings in terms of time, uh, dose, temperature, and spray of water, the impingement, the force with which it comes. And if you change or try to just change a detergent, somebody else offers you another one, you take that, you stick the lance in there and off you go, it will be problematic. You can't do that. You have to revalidate the process. You won't know whether your process is actually really effective or not because of the setup. Remember, remember Cine Circle? It's a complete setup and the whole lot work together. So enzymatic detergents, we tend to use manually at the sink. Important, you must follow the manufacturer's instructions of both your washer and your detergent when using it. Neutral detergents. Neutral detergents are neither acidic nor alkaline and they offer the broadest material compatibility for all sorts of instrument types. And they really are useful. Remember, enzymatics generally are neutral. These chemistries have special surfactants in them to aid in the removal of soils. And neutral detergents, however, are not as effective with hard water. An important concept to bear in mind. Then come the alkaline detergents. Now remember the pH scale. Remember you did this at school. Water is uh, has a pH of seven. That's neutral. Okay. Milk goes towards the acidic range. Now that is a pH of six. Going all the way down to stomach acid is a pH of one. Alkaline type stuff can also be abrasive. Alkaline's blood has a pH of eight. Um, bleach has a pH of 12. I'm not sure what Handy Andy's pH is, but I'm, or, uh, I'm sure it's probably pretty alkaline. So be cautious. That's why we can't use any old household cleaners. We have to be specific and use a product that is actually a medical device to clean a medical device. Alkaline chemistries also have their value add. They can break down a whole range of soils. They are very effective in hard water. Because of their pH, they can have their limits, especially in terms of material compatibility. Now, in our automated washer disinfectors, we tend to use alkaline type detergents. Again, it depends on the setup of the machine, the make, the model, the temperature, the type, everything is dependent on a variety of circumstances. But there is a tendency to use alkaline detergents in many washer disinfectors, not all, but many. And um, but they need to be used correctly. If the dosing is all correct, then the actual in use pH of the of the detergent is not necessarily the pH of the detergent when you look on the bottle. It's slightly different because now it's dissolved in the water as it is meant to be. Right, so that's a little bit of our pH that we've gone through and the difference between enzymatics, neutrals, alkalines. Speciality detergents, we will continue with those in our next webinar. So we have a lot today. We've defined is. We've discussed the clinical importance of cleaning. We've discussed the clinical importance of cleaning with a medical grade detergent to clean medical and surgical devices. We've discussed the fact that detergents are a class A medical device. We've learned about Sinner's circle and the interaction of those four parameters and factors that at the end of the day, together will give us a clean instrument. We've spoken about the importance of pre-cleaning. We've spoken about the harshness of water and water quality and how that can potentially affect your cleaning efficacy.
and how we try to design detergents in such a way as they can compensate for quality of water and water harshness. They can't fix everything, but they certainly will try. And we've learned a little bit about the terms enzymatic, neutral, alkaline and speciality detergents and chemistries. So we will continue to unpack this next week, focusing then on uh, the rest of the information on more the substrate surfactants. Um, we're going to detail about proteins and, and other types of soils and how these types of uh, substrates actually break those down, those soils down. And we'll finish off um, in webinar two also about uh, speciality stuff for managing staining and a little bit of corrosion and lubricants and how they can help aid our instruments as well. So thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, we will send you a link to the recording of today's session as well as the post webinar test. If you'd like a certificate of attendance, you will need to complete that test. Once you've completed the test, give us a few days, uh, you will receive your certificate. Everybody who booked for today, I will automatically send you an invite to next week's webinar. You don't need to re-register, don't stress about that, but we will also then advertise next week's webinar as well. Our recordings of today will be hosted on SAFNET's YouTube channel. And please, you can go back and look at um, a multitude of webinars on our YouTube channel. Just Google www.safnet you know, on YouTube and you will find all of our previous webinars we hosted. If you are now doing some of those webinars, but you, ha you would like a certificate of attendance, email me and I will send you the link to those webinars, the previous webinars tests, so that you can keep your evidence of training up to date. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you had a wonderful time and we'll see you same time next week again. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good day.